Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Tom Banchoff. I'm our Vice President for Global Engagement here at Georgetown. And today, I'm happy to say I'm also a professor in our School of Foreign Service. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to a presentation by the new Dean of SFS, Dr. Joel Hellman, and a follow-on conversation with a distinguished SFS alumnus, Stefan Dujaric, a spokesperson for UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Our topic, as you know, is challenges to global governance. Now, with this event, we inaugurate the second semester of Global Futures, a university-wide initiative designed to highlight and strengthen Georgetown's engagement across four present and future global issues. Last semester, our topic was global development. This semester, it's governance. Next semester, we turn to security, and next fall, to the global environment. Around these issues, the Global Futures Initiative encompasses high-level events and research and teaching activities that build on the strengths of the School of Foreign Service and all of our other schools, the expertise and passion of our faculty and students, our location and convening power here in Washington, D.C., and our Jesuit mission and identity as a university committed to the global common good. Joel, our timing this semester with your arrival on campus is especially good. Global governance just happens to be one of your specialties. And I, I know I speak not just for myself, but for everyone here, that we're delighted to have you with us today to help us think through some of the critical governance challenges we face as a nation and as a global community. It's now my pleasure to introduce President John J. DeJoya, who will provide some background on the initiative and introduce our speakers. Dr. DeJoya became our 48th president in 2001 after more than two decades of service to Georgetown in a range of leadership positions. Over the past 14 years under President DeJoya, Georgetown has emerged as a global force in higher education and as an innovator in efforts to link up our core mission of research and teaching with service to the wider world. Examples include our campus in Doha, Qatar, our high-level dialogues with China, and our pioneering work on global human development and women, peace, and security. President DeJoy addresses broader issues in higher education as chair of the board of directors of the Forum for the Future of Higher Education and as a member of the board of directors for the Association of Jesuit Colleges and Universities, among many other leadership positions. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming President Jack DeJoya. Well, thank you very much, Tom, for those very kind words and for your leadership as Vice President for Global Engagement. And I thank you also for your leadership of the effort that has brought us together this afternoon, the Georgetown Global Futures Initiative. It's a pleasure to be here in Gaston Hall with all of you. Uh, there's nothing quite like being here in Gaston Hall all these years. Every time you get a chance to be on this stage, uh, it's like the first time. And I wish to offer a special welcome to our new students and those of you who are joining via webcast from our campus in Doha. We gather for the first of several discussions we will host this semester examining the many dimensions of global governance. This occasion of coming together also provides us with an additional opportunity, a moment for our community to formally welcome our new Dean of the School of Foreign Service, Dr. Joel Hellman, into our community. As Tom mentioned, we're also privileged to welcome home our alumnus, Stefan Dujaric to engage in discussion with Dean Hellman just a little later in the program. I'll say a few words about Dean Hellman and Mr. Dujaric in a moment, but first I wish to say a few words about the framework that is enabling our conversation today. The, Globe, the Georgetown Global Futures Initiative captures in a new way the vision we have for our way of life here at Georgetown a way of living that has characterized our community for 226 years. This way of life is a reflection of our international character, our Catholic and Jesuit identity, our roles and responsibilities as a university, whether through the formation of our students, through the inquiry of our faculty, 
and the responsibility we have to promoting the common good. It is the ethos, the characteristic spirit of the university to seek the betterment of humankind. The spirit is at the core of the Global Futures Initiative, an initiative which brings together the resources of our tradition with the ambition of our community to discern and model what it means to be an engaged global university in service to the wider world. As Tom mentioned, last semester we focused on the global future of development, which unfolded through work in our classrooms and a series of discussions with global leaders, including World Bank Group President Jim Kim, its chief economist Koshik Basu, former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom Tony Blair, former Administrator of the United States Agency for International Development Raj Shah, and Professor of Philosophy Martha Nussbaum, a leading scholar of the capability approach to human development. Today, Dean Hellman's remarks will inaugurate a semester-long conversation on the global future of governance. In the months ahead in our classrooms and through lectures here on campus, we'll seek a deeper understanding of the challenges of advancing peace, prosperity, and justice between and within our global communities. Just this past year, we see how these challenges, such as violent extremism, refugee crises, global climate change and pandemics have affected communities across the globe. We've also seen that responding to them requires a spirit of innovation, of collaboration, of trust, and our ability to create a better future. At Georgetown, the Global Futures Initiative offers us a framework to bring together the best of our tradition and our many undergraduate and graduate programs to engage more deeply in the work of understanding these challenges and in imagining better, more inclusive solutions. This is work that resonates with our speakers this afternoon, with the work that Dean Hellman will undertake as our new Dean of the Walsh School of Foreign Service and with Mr. Dujaric's service at the United Nations and in the international community. In just a few moments, we'll hear from Dean Hellman as both a scholar and practitioner, he brings to Georgetown a unique and invaluable perspective from his work on issues of governance, conflict, and the political economy of development around the world. He joins our community following 15 years of service at the World Bank Group. He served in an array of roles that focused on governance and reform, working in more than 50 countries across four continents. Over the course of his time there, he worked on a broad range of complex global challenges, including as director of the World Bank's fragile and conflict-affected states department based in Nairobi, and in Indonesia, coordinating the World Bank's response to the devastating tsunami in Aceh and North Sumatra that occurred the day after Christmas in 2004. Most recently, as the World Bank's first chief institutional economist, Dean Hellman led its research and training efforts on governance and institutional reform across the globe. A former member of the faculty at Harvard University and Columbia University, Dean Hellman has also written widely on governance and political economy issues in academic journals and development publications. This is an important moment for us at Georgetown as we consider ways to more deeply engage and respond to global challenges, which in turn are impacting the study and practice of international affairs. We're grateful for the leadership that Dean Hellman brings to us, to the expertise and knowledge that he will share with us this afternoon. And we're also pleased to welcome Mr. Dujaric, current spokesperson for United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, who will engage in conversation with Dean Hellman following his remarks. After graduating from Georgetown School of Foreign Service in 1988, Mr. Dujaric worked at ABC News for 10 years covering a range of global issues. In recent years, he has held a number of distinguished roles within the United Nations, including serving as spokesman for United Nations Secretary General Kofi, Kofi Annan from 2005 to 2006, Deputy Communications Director for Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, 
and Director of News and Media for the United Nations Department of Public Information, where he oversaw the UN's multilingual media efforts. Mr. Dujaric, Stefan, it's a privilege to welcome you back here to campus. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon, and please join me in welcoming Dean Joel Hellman to the podium. Thanks so much, Jack, for that wonderful introduction. It is absolutely a thrill to be in this beautiful room in this great university. It's wonderful to see so many of my new friends, some old friends. It's great to see so many students here. Um, I must say, I, I've been out of academia now for some time. Um, I remember when I was in academia, I think to recall that you used to give your job talk before you were offered the job. Um, um, but I'm very pleased that you had the confidence in me um, to bring me on as dean um, and then to bring me here um, to discuss some of the big issues um, that I've been grappling with in my time, um, both as an academic and as a practitioner. Um, and I hope we can sort of share some of those ideas today. This is not a job talk. Actually, it's more um, like a personal journey. Um, I'm going to tell a little bit about uh, what I've been doing, some of the engagements that I've had, and also what led me to come here to Georgetown and some of my hopes about how Georgetown can help address some of the governance challenges, the global governance challenges that I'm going to discuss today. So let me sort of start. And if you don't mind, I'm going to move around a little bit because we're going to be sort of showing you some slides, some data, and giving you some uh, basic things to talk about um, as we begin the discussion. First, I want to start with a positive note on global governance. If we look at the level of extreme poverty, the share of the population that's living under $1.25 a day, which is the sort of standard poverty line, what we see is that extreme poverty is declining at an unprecedented rate. It's the fastest decline in extreme poverty in recorded human history. Um, since 1993 to 2011, the extreme poverty share um, has fallen by more than half. It is an extraordinary achievement. In fact, uh, right here in our audience, Steve Rattlet is here. Um, Steve has is, uh, is just finished uh, a wonderful sort of book called The Great Surge, which is going to be out sort of soon, talking about this sort of tremendous achievement in global poverty reduction. So we start in the global governance on a very positive note. At the same time, if we sort of look behind the numbers on that extreme reduction, what we see is that China and India, with their very, very large populations and their very, very rapid growth rates um, over the last sort of two decades, have been really the dominant force behind that reduction in extreme poverty. And if we look at a group of countries, which I'll describe in a minute, that we, we call the fragile sort of states, um, we actually see that the poverty rates there are pretty much stayed stable over a long period of time. And in fact, even more recently, there's been an uptick um, in poverty rates um, in the fragile states. Who are these fragile states? We, many, there are many different definitions, but um, we, um, going back to the definition of the World Bank, um, uh, classify 33 countries as fragile sort of states based on the quality of their institutions um, and the extent to which there has been peacekeeping forces or active conflict in the countries. There are 33, as I said, um, largely concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa, but across um, most um, of the world. Now, if we look at fragile states as a share of all developing countries' populations, it's actually a rather small share. There's only about 7% of the population um, uh, of those sort of 33, uh, 33 fragile states. Of the whole sort of share of the less developed world, this is about 70%, 7% of the world's um, less developed population. If we look at the share of the fragile states in population of the extreme poor, um, we sort of see that that 7% jumps to about sort of 16%. So right now, the 33 fragile states make up about 16% of the world's extreme poor. Now, if we start to go beyond 2010 
and we project numbers through the growth rates of the developing world and the growth rates of the least, um, uh, the most difficult, fragile states, and we project out poverty rates, um, what we sort of see is that the fragile states will go from 16% to about 37% of the world's extreme poor. There are many, many different calculations, many, many different ways of looking at this. 37% is on the conservative side. There are some estimates that by 2030, in 15 years' time, not a terribly long period of time, um, the share of the population of the extreme poor concentrated in fragile states could be up to sort of 60%. That suggests that at current rates of growth um, in 15 years and beyond, um, the extreme poverty problem is going to be a, a problem heavily concentrated in fragile states. Um, and I think that leads us to start to think about how do we rethink development? How do we rethink the global governance architecture in a world in which extreme poverty is largely concentrated um, in the fragile states, in states that are affected by conflict? Now, we know, of course, that fragile states lag seriously behind on the Millennium Development Goals. These are the main sort of targets that are sort of driving um, uh, development progress across the world. Um, of the nine targets here, um, as you sort of see in most of the targets, most of the less developed states are moving towards achieving 100%, 80 60%, achieving some of those targets. If we look at the red, um, we see that very few of the fragile states are on track to achieving any of the Millennium Development Goals. So these states are falling further and further behind. And of course, if we look at the problem of migration and refugees, and obviously this is something on everyone's mind these days, the 33 states currently make up 84% of the population of refugees. Um, so this, uh, the, the group of fragile states is really a main sort of source of the, of the issues um, that are affecting us today. Now, if we look at global official assistance, official development assistance, this is not humanitarian assistance. These are investments in development um, overall. Um, there's an, a question as to whether or not we are sort of keeping pace, whether our development investments are actually keeping pace um, with the changes in the trends that we see in poverty reduction. So this looks at essentially um, what um, is the overall sort of level of development assistance. Um, and it looks at the share of all developing countries and the share that goes to fragile states. And we can ask ourselves, is in fact aid starting to go where poverty is now? Or is it beginning to look at the trends in poverty and where poverty will be over time? And what we sort of see um, is that in fact, um, still the bulk, the dominant sort of share of development assistance um, goes to the less developed countries, a smaller share, much smaller share, goes to those 33 fragile sort of states. And if we actually look at the share that goes to largely two countries, Afghanistan and Iraq, where there's been active conflict, what we can see is that the dominant sort of share, um, or a large sort of share, of the development assistance that the world gives to fragile states is concentrated in the conflict countries of Afghanistan um, and Iraq. Now, if we look at the United States, that's overall development assistance um, for all countries. If we look at just the US, its overseas development assistance budget is even more heavily concentrated. Large sort of share of it, 50%, um, goes to all developing, all developing countries. Um, if we look at the 50% that goes to fragile states, as you see, a large sort of chunk of it goes to the fragile states of U.S. security concern, largely Iraq and Afghanistan. It also includes sort of South Sudan and Sudan. Um, and a very sort of small share, relatively sort of small share, um, is going to the other fragile states. And if we look not only at the overall level of aid um, that's going to fragile states, if we look at the distribution, we find that it's sort of very highly skewed. There are a group of countries um, at the very bottom of the, of the list of fragile states um, that get sort of tiny shares um, of development assistance on a per capita, on a per person basis. And if you compare it to what's in Afghanistan in the yellow 
comparing it to the red or the pink, what you're seeing is multiple sort of levels um, uh, of development assistance um, on a per capita basis going to Afghanistan as opposed to the weakest fragile states or what we commonly refer to as some of the aid orphans. There's a highly sort of skewed distribution of aid across different countries. And some of these aid distortions can be extreme. I want to give you just one example. In one province in Afghanistan, Helmand province, which was the site of very heavy fighting, the government's own budget in Helmand province from the government of Afghanistan was $49 million. The governor's own budget, the governor of Helmand province, he had a $700,000 budget. We rounded it off to $1 million. The overall aid budget in Helmand province was $350 million. So if you start to think about how aid has been distributed across fragile states, it's not only that the overall level of aid is not keeping track with where poverty is going over the next sort of 10, 15 years. It's not only that there's a highly skewed distribution across individual countries, leaving some countries as aid orphans and some countries um, essentially awash with aid. If you look down individually, even at the province level, there are tremendous distortions um, that the distribution of aid can create, vastly overwhelming the capacity of any individual government um, to be able to spend and spend that money effectively. So we have a very sort of skewed distribution of aid and a key challenge of thinking about the global governance architecture as we start to see a shift of more and more of the poverty concentrated into fragile states is how do we get a more stable, how do we get a, a more reasonable distribution um, of assistance um, to ensure greater effectiveness of assistance. But what will it take not only to ensure a better distribution of aid, what will it take and what does it mean um, if the development business, if you will, if our development efforts are more and more concentrated in countries with deep security problems, in countries with extremely weak institutions, in countries with extremely low capacity. We have a development architecture that's largely been built up over tremendous and important programs in countries like India, Indonesia, Brazil, sort of Turkey. How do we start to adjust our thinking about development to countries with a very, very, very different sort of structure of institutions, a very, very different level of quality of institutions, a very, very different level of quality of human capacity. What does that mean for the global governance architecture, and what does it mean for aid and assistance as we go forward? Let me take a couple of different specific problems um, that are unique to the fragile states that we have to grapple with as we think about the new aid architecture and the global governance architecture going forward. First, security and development. If aid is largely concentrated among the fragile states um, with security problems, how do we secure the space for aid? Here's a picture in Afghanistan. I spent a lot of time in Afghanistan. Um, there were provincial reconstruction teams which were the forward face of development. What you see here is a picture um, of um, a discussion with community elders. Um, to discuss their development needs. And what you saw, what, I, what you see in that picture, what I saw many times, was a discussion with elders by full military dress, um, uh, uniform sort of soldiers, um, with arms. I recall myself a discussion that um, I was sort of seated with a bunch of elders, um, and I was listening to a young man from Arkansas, about 22, 23 years old, and he was talking about the development needs um, that the elders would be facing. Frankly, I couldn't understand a single word he was saying. Um, he was a young guy. He was using a lot of sort of slang. And I turned to the translator and I said, um, how are you translating this, the translator in Pashto? Because I can't understand any of it. And he said, oh, I just make it up. <laughs> um, and the truth is that if you looked at the effort to kind of communicate with a community um, from soldiers who are delivering assistance, um, in full military dress, um, in, in a level and a form of, of engagement that is really well outside of the military sort of scope of engagement and the way they interact, um, you realize the challenges it's going to make to make 
development work in highly insecure environments. Now, we need to secure the space for development. There's no question about that. And that's going to be an incredible risk as we go forward. But we need to go further and think about how do we do development in these highly insecure environments? How do we deliver and implement development? Can we do it through the military? What are the problems of doing it through the military? If we think about state building um, as a unique problem in fragile states, we often think when we, when we do state building efforts in development, we think about states the way we know them, offices, um, individuals um, with titles, um, with sort of clear mandates or reasonably clear mandates, um, with all of the accoutrements of what a government looks like. But if we go down, um, especially to local governments, what we sort of see is that often um, state building looks very different than our sort of assumptions about what a state is. It's often an empty room um, with a single desk, um, with a single powerful individual who uses individual relationships, um, often sort of tribal or historically linked relationships to communities, um, rather than the basic um, accoutrements, offices, um, everything that you need to create a state. How do you create and how do you build a state in that kind of environment? What we sort of see is that we know a lot about how states function. We know very little about building states, creating states in areas in which informal power sort of structures, um, uh, in, in, in areas and communities um, where the basic sort of framework for state engagement um, in bureaucracy um, and officialdom um, don't exist. So I think there's a, a need to really rethink what state building means in some of these countries. If we talk about human capacity, thinking about how to develop the human capacity um, of the countries that we work with. One of the important aspects of donor engagement and aid engagement, historically, have not only been what the aid projects achieve in terms of their results and what they build, but often the level of engagement um, that the aid donors have with local officials, with local communities, with local NGOs. But if we actually start to count how much time we spend um, with those officials, with those NGOs, in fragile states versus others, we see, again, sort of some significant differences. This looks at the average number of person days. If you look at every single day someone spends in country, by international staff, local staff, those who travel, um, and you just add them up, um, you get an average level of 12,000 person days. Um, that donors sort of spend engaging with local officials, local NGOs in developed, developing countries. Um, in fragile states where we should be engaging even more to make sure that these things, these projects are effective, where we should be giving, e engaging even more to make sure that we work closely um, with these officials, NGOs, and others, um, we're spending considerably less time, almost a quarter less time, because of the security concerns, because of the difficulties of traveling there. So if we want to engage, we want to do the human capacity building, we've got to start thinking about how we reverse that. In terms of risk and risk management, we're all worried, of course, about corruption. We're all worried about results. We want to get results from our taxpayer dollars that go into aid and assistance. Um, and yet, if the problem of extreme poverty is largely concentrated in fragile states with difficult security problems, with extremely low capacity, we have to understand that the risk of failure, um, that the likelihood of achieving results is going to be much lower, much greater levels of risk. And yet there is indeed a risk mania, if you will, um, in much of the donor community to show sort of short-term results, sort of show um, uh, measurable results. But if we work in this much, much more difficult group of countries, are we going to be able to show those results? Are we going to be able to create a measurement sort of system um, that, that adequately assesses the results relative to the risks that we're taking? And how do we deal with the fact that it's just going to cost a hell of a lot more to work in these environments? This looks at the amount of money the World Bank sort of spends per thousand dollars of lending um, uh, in the poorest countries, comparing the fragile states to the other developing countries. And what you see is it costs about three times as much for the same amount of lending in order to manage um, and move forward with that lending. Now, we've talked about some of the problems, the difficulties that we have to think about in fragile states. But I think actually the most important thing we need to think about as 
the nature of the challenges um, in the aid architecture and global governance change is rethinking time frames. Um, because the time frames of working in these kinds of environments are vastly different. Now, I want to play a, a bit of a thought game with you. We have good measurements of the quality of institutions um, over the course of all developing countries. Um, we have a very good database that looks over 25 years of the quality of institutions across these countries, and you could measure progress and change over those countries over time. And I simply asked the question, how long would it take Haiti, an archetypal sort of fragile state, to reach the quality of institutions of a country like Bangladesh? Not Denmark, not Sweden, not the United States, not Indianapolis, um, you know, just reaching from where it is now to reach the basic level um, of Bangladesh. Let's see, start in 2012, the clock is still ticking. By Haiti's own measures of progress, the pace of institutional reform it's achieved over the last 20 years, it wouldn't take an additional 102 years to reach the level of quality of Bangladesh. What if we ask a sudden another question? How long would it take Haiti to reach the quality level of institutions of Bangladesh if it reformed its institutions at the same pace as the fastest reformers ever in the database that we've looked at? The Koreas, the Singapores, um, those who really have made sort of tremendous progress on institutional quality over the years. Given Haiti's low base, though, how long would it take? Again, let's look. From 2012 to 2037. So in other words, um, oh, 2038, another 26 years simply to move from the level of quality they have now, of the quality of the strength of their institutions, to the level of quality and the strength of the institutions in Bangladesh. If they moved at the pace of the fastest reformers who've ever um, undertaken institutional reform. What does that say? Maybe it's depressing. Um, certainly, it is daunting to sort of see these long sort of time frames. But given the low base of the institutional quality that you start to see in fragile states, given the amount of progress they have to traverse in order to reach even basic sort of levels of institutional quality, we need to rethink our time frames. Most projects, which have results indicators that sort of bring, or that try to bring places like Haiti up to the quality levels of Sweden and Switzerland and Denmark, um, um, are projects that have a three to five year time frame. But if we look and think about time frames this way, in a different way, we need to be really rethinking what does it mean um, to, a sort of, to support the development of institutional quality? How do we begin that process over a very, very long period of time? How do we measure results um, when the results are going to be staggered over a long period of time, when the final end results may not be what we normally sort of think of in terms of institutional quality at the developed country level, um, but are actually much more realistic for the country at the time? I think that requires us to fundamentally rethink um, how we do and how we govern the aid architecture. So what can we do? A colleague of mine, Jeffrey Sachs, often sort of says, um, that we know the answers to what needs to be done to solve some of the most chronic problems, even in these most difficult cases. The issue is that we just don't fund them sufficiently um, in order to really see those solutions move towards a comprehensive approach. But what I'm trying to suggest here is something quite different. Here, with the levels of insecurity, with the levels of institutional quality, with the levels of human capacity, um, what we need to do in order to shift and be effective in these environments is really rethink and even remake um, the global governance architecture for assistance to recognize that the poverty problem is largely going to be focused on these most difficult cases, that the time frame for these most difficult cases is radically different um, than the time frame that we've assumed in most of our development activity, 
that the nature of the security challenges, the capacity challenges, and the institutional challenges are remarkably different. And we need to be thinking about how we meet those challenges. Now, what can we do here, finally, here in Georgetown? Um, and why did, from my vantage point, um, coming to Georgetown at this time um, seem like such an attractive option? I must sort of say that in the last sort of 15 years of frontline development work in mostly sort of fragile states, um, the biggest problem was that we had really yet to find real sort of solutions, real ideas for how we can address some of the key challenges that I just put up here today. Key challenges in terms of security, time frame, institutional challenge, challenges, human development, and human capacity challenges. We need to fundamentally rethink these issues. Georgetown. Uh, offers the opportunity, and the School of Foreign Service in particular, offers the opportunity to really rethink these issues in a different way. Because one of the key things that we need to think about is first, how do we look from various different vantage points, cultural, institutional, um, political, historical, to think about um, a new way of approaching institutional development and human capacity development in these countries? How do we bring together security issues um, and the development issues in a new way. And we have that capacity in SFS to think through these different kinds of issues. Um, and how do we readjust our time frame of thinking in order to sort of uh, deal with the new challenges um, that we've got? I think that Georgetown has an extraordinary opportunity to really look deeply into those issues through its multidisciplinary approach, through the kind of uh, faculty and strength and links between theory and practice that we sort of see across this sort of school. Um, and for me, it's an extraordinary attractive option to really take the time um, to work here in this environment to rethink some of those issues, to start to think through new solutions to some of these issues, um, and start to help us rethink how to reshape the global governance architecture to recognize the shifts in poverty and the challenges in poverty. We also have one other advantage here in Georgetown that I want to put and think very seriously about, which is our Jesuit values, of course, and the Jesuit organizational network. If we look again at that map of fragile states, what we see is that the Jesuit organizational network, the Jesuit refugee service, the Jesuit volunteers corps, the Jesuit schools, um, they reach out to all of these countries. We have an extraordinary opportunity in an organizational network that enables Georgetown to reach out to these communities, um, both as opportunities for our students and faculty to engage, um, and also as ways for us to find some of the best, brightest, and most hopeful sort of prospects for us to engage with from these countries. That's a tremendous resource that I want to explore um, as dean of SFS, um, along with the great intellectual resources, um, student resources, <laughs> alumni resources that will enable us to start to rethink sort of some of these fundamental issues. And that's what I would like to try to lead as we move forward um, with the next um, phase and the next years of SFS's development. Thank you very much. Um, we're now going to move, and I'm going to invite Stefan um, to come up. Um, and we're going to use this, some of the issues, some of the challenges, some of the data here, um, to open up a discussion between us and then to you. So thank you very much. Which one do you want to Either way. Great, Joel, thank you for that great presentation. Uh, Jack, thank you for that really warm introduction. And for me, it is the first time sitting on this stage at Gaston Hall. And I have, I've been having nightmares for the last four nights thinking that you would unearth my academic record uh, <laughs> before showing up here. So it's absolutely great to see uh, so many of you here. Um, it's just great, great opportunity. Um, I will add, I am, as a spokesman, I am by nature a little paranoid, and I will say that Whatever I say, opinions I express here are my own and not those of my boss or the organization that pays for my salary and that I proudly, uh, that I proudly serve the United Nations. Um, I think you've, you've outlined the, the, the challenges of, uh, of global governance. The, 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 the aid, the development governance at the international level could not be more complex, confusing, uh, made up of a number of international agencies, uh, bilateral donors, national agencies, a lot of them competing for uh, the same pot of money, the small pot of money. Um, and with aid that we see is not predictable, 
is tied to national budgets. Um, and in a sense that aid is, uh, aid budgets are often dictated by political needs, uh, whether the, the amount of money that's set or where it's spent. How do we, or do we need, but how do we depoliticize uh, development aid? How do we help move it away from just strategic, narrow strategic interests to more global shared interests? I think that's an extraordinary challenge, and I think that's really, I think, the challenge of the new global governance architecture that we need to be thinking through. Um, you know, when it comes to sort of a support to fragile states in particular, the need um, for a kind of a stronger overarching sort of framework mm -hmm. for that assistance um, is even greater than, than anywhere else where maybe letting a thousand flowers bloom um, has less risks. Because as we sort of saw in some of the examples, um, in the feast or famine approach to sort of aid, um, we have problems on both sides. There are countries like Central African Republic um, uh, where the, the amount of assistance is, especially um, prior to the most recent troubles in CAR, is so low um, that we're just not meeting kind of basic human needs and we're opening up enormous amounts of risk. And at the, at the same time, we also sort of see this tremendous sort of piling on um, of donor assistance on key sort of security concerns with sort of uh, a, a, such a strength and a force that it overwhelms the capacity of individual um, countries, governments, um, local government to actually sort of cope. So it's a feast or sort of famine approach. Um, and you're right that it's largely sort of politically motivated. Each country um, has this sort of strong motivation um, responding to its sort of taxpayer concerns, its um, organizational concerns. Um, but it is crit critical given what we're sort of seeing as of the shift of, of aid becomes more and more focused in fragile states and these risks become greater and greater that we think of a sort of stronger architecture. We had, and uh, I mean, I was very pleased to work um, with the UN um, from the World Bank side um, on thinking about how to make more coherent the whole process of aid and assistance from humanitarian relief um, through development. We worked also to think about how we can pool funds and pool governance over that funds so that in Afghanistan, although ultimately it was still a small share of funds, um, but in Afghanistan, mul multiple donors got together to bring a multi-donor financing framework that was governed by a larger sort of number um, of donors and that had a very strong government presence so that we were hearing the governance, vo the governance voice. We see that in disaster assistance, and we have seen the community move much further forward in disaster assistance, recognizing all of the ways in which disaster assistance can be undermined by some of the problems that I um, raised here. So I think we can do it on disaster assistance. Multi-donor frameworks are working. Governance frameworks that put the government in the driver's seat through these multi-donor frameworks also has it helped to discipline the political interests of donors. And I think as we move to an aid um, world, where fragile states are more and more the core of what we're doing, I think we have to be moving much more towards an architecture um, that builds upon our experience um, in those other countries. But, you, you know, it's interesting because it is true that on the humanitarian aid, through the coordination of aid, we've, we've done a much better job at, at, at the UN writ large. And I like to think the World Bank being part of the UN, we like, uh, <laughs> we, we, we like sometimes to, to, to claim you, not always, but sometimes, uh, or claim your former employer, I should say. Um, <laughs> Is, but is, is part of the problem on the development and is it the mentality of development practitioners? Does that also need to, does that need to shift? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good point. Um, you know, I do think that um, for years when we thought about development and we thought about development assistance, um, we thought about development assistance in stable and secure environments. So the world was essentially divided into two. There were security issues, there were security concerns. The UN is sort of handling that. They're largely humanitarian relief efforts. Um, and then when there's stability, the development actors can come in um, and begin to build the programs, build the institutional and human capacity that's sort of necessary for a longer sort of term development. You know, and in the UN, this has been a big important topic of conversation, um, that that divide um, between humanitarian efforts and development assistance 
is melting away. Um, as a recognition to do relief effectively, you have to think about the long-term implications of relief. Um, but also to do development effectively, you all also need to understand um, the relief efforts, the political and economic sort of circumstances um, in a, in a post-disaster, post-conflict, and, um, and other environments. So I do think that the mentality over the years has developed where these two things were separate. They're starting to come together, but I don't think that there has yet been the real sort of shift in mindset that says, okay, if development work is largely no longer Indonesia, India, Brazil, sort of Turkey, but it's sort of South Sudan, Somalia, Yemen, um, what does that mean? What do we have to change? What do we have to change in terms of budget? What do we have to change in terms of training? What do we have to change in terms of the mentality of the development professionals? How do we get to think how do we get them to think in the time frames that are necessary to think about institutional quality? How do we get them to deal with the security issues and get them to understand how to work within that kind of security environment? I think we are still at a very early sort of stage in making that shift in the development world. The UN um, uh, has been a lot, uh, obviously, uh, engaged in this from a much earlier sort of standpoint, um, but we need to make that sort of shift. No, and I think you're right, and I think this is a place where, as, as you mentioned earlier, I think a university like Georgetown has a role to play in training people differently, in, in producing different kinds of graduates who then go into the international world, into development aid. I think we were all a little stunned by the, the numbers you showed uh, at Hellman Province, you know, the amount of money that's, uh, that's poured in. And I think Hellman is just one example. We see a lot of places where aid for political reasons is poured in, where the absorption capacity of the country is extremely limited, if non-existent. And sometimes from the UN institutional point of view, I sometimes fear that even the capacity of UN institutions to absorb all that aid is limited and increases the risks for um, challenges to, to prop up. Is, are those places like, is the aid wasted? I mean, is it, is it useless? It's, at what point is it just, are you just pouring aid and is it, it's overflowing and not doing anything? You know, it gets to a point, and we started, uh, I started to show just some photos and give some anecdotes about what happens when aid is militarized in terms of the delivery of aid is militarized. Why is 350, why was $350 million being poured into the Helmand province of, you know, a, 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 a province with a budget of sort of $50 million. The reason was there was a sort of transactional approach to the assistance that was very much linked to the government's, the U.S. Right. and ISAF's um, counterinsurgency strategy. To put it in a kind of crude way, I would look at that aid. Um, I, I think there were sort of two types of aid that were given in Afghanistan. We started in Iraq. Um, and, and it's really sort of challenging for us to think about it um, in counterinsurgency strategy. There was a... Here's some money, don't shoot me aid. Right. You know, direct sort of transactional. If we give you money, we hope that you will have less of an incentive to engage in violence against but us. But is that military. protection money? Um, in some cases, yeah. it was compensation right. money. So we, I mean, there was money directly paid for when there was a break into a house, when there was mm -hmm. a search, when there was uh, animals killed, when there was, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, family members sort of scared. The natural mm -hmm. response was, here's funds, here's money. Um, there was a community response of saying, we're coming into a community, what can we build? Mm -hmm. Can we build roads can we, as a way of sort of uh, securing the peace? And I think that that's what led to such a large amount of mon money being um, uh, trading hands. Right. Um, and that, of course, is not development assistance. That is a transactional assistance that's, desi that's designed to buy peace. Um, and I think that is a problem with the militar militarization of the delivery of aid, because the counterinsurgency strategy, it was difficult to keep the focus on the, the good part of the counterinsurgency strategy was the recognition that development and security go together from the transactional nature of development and citizen military, which is that if we give them money, they won't shoot us. Right. Um, and I think that we need to really rethink the relationship between security and development. Um, so we do get on the do we do recognize the important insights of counterinsurgency strategy did have, but how to implement that, what the role of the military is for implementing aid, I think that's still something that we haven't even barely touched. Right, and you can imagine militarization of aid also implies that the military stays in country. 
right? Yeah. It, and which has political implications. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the kinds of, again, going back to the time frame, the kinds of time frame necessary to build and sort of strengthen institutions yeah. that might create the basis for stability mm -hmm. over the longer term, those are long time frames. Right. Um, whether the military is ready or it's even desirable, right. of course, um, for the military to spend time, pence in that kind of time right. frames in a country is something I don't think we sort of have on the agenda when we talked about the role of the military in aid. You know, we talked about the, the, the militarization of aid. One issue which has, I've given some thought of, and is the privatization of aid. We see uh, people like Bill Gates set up foundations that dwarf UN agencies. Um, there are para, you know, there are organizations like Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines, which takes in a lot of private money. But we can imagine five, 10 years down the line where people like Jack Ma, one of the largest fortunes in China, decides to emulate Bill Gates. Or you know, anybody on the top, the Forbes, I think 30 biggest fortunes have combined uh, assets of about a trillion dollars. How, you know, or should we be thinking about the role of private individuals and what avenues they use for aid and the risks for private individuals who have so much money, who control so much, to involve themselves in development? I mean, it's absolutely, you're absolutely right that the private provision of aid, philanthropy, mm -hmm. Um, bringing in sort of private sector models and thinking about mm -hmm. how to make aid effective um, is something that we really need to right. grapple with, especially as the aid problem becomes one focused on more and more difficult sort of environments. There's one very, very positive uh, element to that, um, which is, I mean, and you hear it in Gates all the time, that there are, on the private sector sort of side, um, I think there's a much greater understanding of risk and reward. Um, and a much greater understanding of um, how do we undertake an investments that could potentially play significant sort of dividends over time in terms of stability, in terms of sort of peace, and what risks are we willing to take um, in order to do that. If you hear Bill Gates talk, Bill Gates would be the first to sort of say, I expect 60, 70 percent um, of my projects to fail right. um, because they've taken sort of significant risks, and if they're not I'm taking a kind of capital markets approach to my aid portfolio, and I'm looking for the big wins. Um, you know in the UN, I can tell you in the World Bank, um, and we know in most multilateral organizations, um, none of them are willing to take that kind no. of risk reward profile. Um, and none of them are willing to think about um, uh, results mm -hmm. that are reasonable and, and, and planable and doable in the time frames that they have. Because we're all so taken um, by grandiose claims. Um, you know, we need to move these institutions to the quality of developed countries in, you know, in right. five, seven, eight years. Where I think you get an approach to results that can be much more realistic, um, uh, that can bite off chunks um, in, in, in manageable distances. Right. So I think there are potential real positives to that thinking about aid. At the same time, there are real risks, as, as you say, real downsides, in the sense that the work of aid in these insecure environments mm. is dangerous. Right. Um, the, the, the risks of doing harm are greater. Um, so, of course, a principle that all aid agencies um, like think of as do no harm as our first principle. Right. But the opportunities, the possibilities of doing harm um, by you know, this kind of crowding in that we've sort of seen this, over right. this, this overwhelming of capacity is there. And there is very, very little incentive for the private aid um, and the philanthropy community to be part of that overall global architecture. So I think we need to think about a governance architecture over aid that brings in the best of um, the private sector sort of approaches but also brings in um, these actors so that they are part of an overall governance architecture that does no harm. Um, and that brings a additive value to all the, the different players um, in the aid architecture. You know, and, and talking about time frames, I mean, the, the, the figures you show between Haiti and, uh, Haiti and Bangladesh were, uh, were quite stark. Do you think there are some in the national donor communities who are starting to understand the need to invest money over five, 10, 
years or even longer, obviously, and take the political heat at home? Or are we not there yet? I don't think we're there yet. Yeah. It's just not part of the architecture to sort of have a 10-year time frame. It's not sort of the planning architecture. It's not part of the mindset. Um, it's very difficult to get aid projects approved over that time frame. It's very difficult to get people and individuals who are willing to invest that long a time frame in any individual sort of set of engagements. Um, so on the time frame, I think it's the issue where we're least uh, where we made the least progress, and I see the least movement. I think it does, that's why it's so critical, I think, here at Georgetown, um, that we begin to get people to understand better what's the reasonable time frame for institutional development, right. what is the pace of institutional sort of change, how do we think about the dynamics and mechanisms of institutional change in a more realistic way. Great. I'm told uh, that we have to start the Q&A uh, with, with the students, so... I think we'll, uh, I'll stop grilling you and uh, we'll open up to your, uh, to your students. Please, if you could identify yourself as well. Sure. Thanks. Thank you, Dean Hellman, for your presentation. Uh, having previously worked at both the World Bank as well as the United Nations, it's great to hear from both of you today. Uh, I'm not a student. I am the Associate Director of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. And I wanted to make an observation and relatedly pose a question. The majority of the world's poor are women, and when you think about the, fa the human face of extreme poverty, it's the unbanked woman. In fragile states, it's widows. So in your presentation, it was interesting to me that this dimension did not come up, and the photograph from Afghanistan was particularly telling because another thing I noticed is there were no women amongst the elders who are being consulted. When women are considered, it's only as beneficiaries and almost never as partners, let alone leaders. So my question to you is this. How, as a practitioner, have you worked to integrate this dimension into your work? And how do you intend to bring that into educating the next generation of world leaders? Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, your observation is absolutely right. Um, you know, that the extreme poverty problem is not only sort of more and more sort of concentrated um, in fragile states, but within um, the population of the extreme poor, um, women make up a larger and larger sort of dimension of that, um, especially the problem um, of widows, those impacted most, uh, whose families are impacted most by the security issues. Um, the Afghanistan story, of course, is a complex one, as you know. Um, uh, there are not, um, and, and one has to think through how to be most effective in outreaching different parts of the community. And as you know, in the structure of elders, in the structure of the way communities work, um, engaging um, with the elders is largely uh, uh, an all-male affair. That doesn't mean, though, um, that the donor outreach and community is not also reaching women, although in a place like Afghanistan, in very sort of separate ways. Um, there have been a lot of individual efforts sort of targeted particularly at widows. And one of the things that I was very closely involved in at the World Bank um, was thinking about various ways of community support, support for the entire community that was based on an engagement um, with the widows um, and how the communities could get sort of support and assistance um, which would then you be used to flow um, to widows and sort of supporting widows. Um, so that was an interesting way, a sort of twist on different traditional community-driven development approaches that took widows as sort of the focus of the analysis and used brought, tried to bring together the communities around sort of supporting the widows. Um, and I thought it was an interesting and had some very, very interesting results. Um, there are more and more efforts also to outreach um, uh, women in terms of capacity, women in terms of private sort of sector engagement, but as you know, in many of these countries, this is going to be the most difficult community um, to reach out to, difficult parts of the community to reach out to, partly because of the cultural issues, um, partly because of the isolation, um, and partly because of the, you know, the inaccessibility um, of reaching out to the communities through the male sort of power structures um, that have been placed. So it's a tremendous sort of challenge. It's one that really should be driving our thinking about how to reach out better um, to women for these communities, because I think it's absolutely sort of critical. Um, but it's one in which we're gonna have to think about how we put that in a reasonable mix in communities where these male sort of structures still dominate the way in which we engage. Thank you. Dean Hellman, I want to thank you for your lecture today, and Mr. Dujaric, thank you for moderating. 
My name is Mike Fox, and I'm a second year Master of Science in Foreign Service student. My question is, for those of us who are looking forward to working in development and related fields, how would you recommend for us to pursue careers that embrace innovation or taking risks when a lot of the opportunities that we might be faced with are in these large bureaucracies that, as you mentioned, can be risk adverse at times? Yeah, I, I, it's a great question, and I'm glad to see you're sort of thinking about that as you kind of think about your own sort of career. Um, I actually think that there are, of course, um, uh, strong um, elements of resistance within large bureaucracies. That's the sort of nature of large bureaucracies. But I want to go back to a point that says Stefan raised. I actually think the issue, in my view, in my experience, has been less with the nature of the bureaucracy placing constraints and more about the mind view of the individuals and the practitioners who are engaging. And this is especially true um, in the development community. There is a vast difference, as Stefan knows, um, between the kind of individual um, that goes into um, relief work, um, the kind of individual that goes into humanitarian assistance, and the kind of individual that goes into development. And that has been developed and that has developed over the years because of the kinds of challenges, the kinds of opportunities, the kinds of situations, the kinds of countries that they've worked with and engaged with and the mindsets that they've developed. Um, what I don't see um, enough of are individuals who really think very, very differently about the development sort of challenges, who are willing to work in the most difficult environments, who recognize that um, in, in some of these cases, money is not necessarily the, the, the main factor that the big flashy sort of operations and the big flashy uh, loans are not going to be what drive results, um, and that who are willing to be in it for the long term. And what I'm concerned about is there are fewer, fewer and fewer people, I think, um, who kind of think in that way. Um, who have that kind of mindset. When they're there, I think they get extraordinary opportunities. I think there's a real hunger for these agencies to find people who want to work in these environments, who think innovatively and creatively about doing it. You'll face plenty of constraints, don't get me wrong. Um, but I think that it's more getting the right people who have that experience. And that's why I think these kinds of th four are important, to get you to be thinking about this as you go ahead and think about a career. If I, can, if, if I can add something, I think you will find by the time you get into the workforce here a much different United Nations. Whether it's UNICEF or World Food Program, to give you two examples, have innovation labs where they've recruited people from Silicon Valley and other places to look how, how they can innovate in delivery of, of aid and development aid. Uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has set up a data lab to look at how, to take the example of the Amazons of the world who, you know, who know what you want to buy before you do, to look at all the data exhaust um, from uh, the developing world where there's a huge penetration of cell phone usage and increasing internet use. How can we use that data for development, for long-term development and investment? So I think the, the structures are changing and slowly changing, but I think to really change, they will need people with innovative minds who are willing to take risks. Thank you. We'll take one question from here and then we'll move to our friends in Qatar who've sent some questions as well. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much again, Dante Mazzari, first year MSFS. If you could get a little closer to the microphone, please. All right, thank there you. we go. Um, so my question was for Dean Hellman, to what extent is it necessary for new aid practitioners to engage with corrupt elements in fragile states, and to what extent does engaging with those elements contribute to their fragility? That's a good question. <laughs> and this is going to be one, I think, one of the most sort of serious challenges sort of as we, as we move forward, um, and the changing sort of shape of the, the poverty, extreme poverty problem leads us to be working in more difficult environments where corruption is much even more serious problem that we've sort of faced in the developing community um, as a whole. Um, there's no question that we're gonna be facing these risks. Um, it's just, it's a reality of working in those sort of countries. Um, there are, and, and there are ways in which to try to protect as best we can um, the flows, because obviously the constituencies that provide the funding for those flows have very, very strong views if that money is sort of stolen. Um, but again, I think this is a mindset we have to start thinking about how we sort of change. Um, not to sort of say that um, 
uh, you know, we want to sort of welcome the corruption that we're going to face in these countries, but we have to have a recognition of the risks that we're going to face um, as we engage in those countries. Um, and we have to think about how we put more and more processes in place, procedures in place, um, to try to protect the funds in those kinds of difficult environments. It's not going to be foolproof. There's going to be a lot of risk involved, but it's a reality of, I think, working in those countries, and I think it's a reality that we have to face. We can say, you know, to all those who want to hear, well, of course, you know, we have zero tolerance for corruption. And of course we have zero tolerance for any efforts that we can actively uncover and engage, but we have to recognize what we're gonna face in those countries, and it's a reality. Thank, thank you. Um, a question that was uh, emailed in from uh, Qatar, and that is, in what ways can the international community, including the UN, directly address the Syrian refugee crisis in Europe? Yeah, this is a, a huge issue. And I think from the development standpoint, one thing I would like to sort of say on the Syrian crisis is that there is, of course, the effort to mitigate the immediate um, needs um, of the population, um, of, uh, to, to, to handle the kind of awful sort of images, um, all, the awful sort of stories that we've sort of seen, the difficult sort of circumstances we've seen for so many people risking their lives um, to flee conflict. From the development angle, I think the way we have to think about it is how do we work with the host communities um, to really sort of strengthen the host community's ability um, to absorb and intake um, large amounts of refugees. Um, I had the privilege of working in Lebanon, um, in Jordan, um, and I think one of the key issues um, was thinking not about this refugee crisis, a standard refugee crisis where you have refugees in camps and you're providing them with, with food, these were refugees who were coming into communities, right. um, renting houses, looking for employment, and that was having a major impact on services, major impact in the private sort of sector, major impact on the housing market, that was starting to weaken their welcome right. in Lebanon and Jordan and their ability, to, which then of course pushed them even out further. So I think from the development angle, what we need to do um, for the Syrian crisis, obviously in the humanitarian angle is an important element to it, but we need to be thinking about how do we give immediate sort of support to increase the ability of host communities to absorb um, this fairly high capacity group um, of, uh, of, my, of migrants and refugees um, and create an environment in which they can be absorbed into the countries. Yeah, and I think, you know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trained to answer questions, so I have to answer, I have to, I wanted to just add something, and I find <laughs> it difficult just to ask questions. Um, I think what we're, we're, we're also, the, the, the pictures we're seeing out of Europe are, are tragic, and I think there, obviously, from the UN standpoint, this should redouble, we, we're redoubling our efforts to find a political solution to the conflict, just to end the conflict in Syria, and it should be a wake-up call to the Security Council, which remains divided on, on the issue. And the other thing is our humanitarian work in Lebanon, in Jordan, Turkey, and Iraq is woefully underfunded. Where World Food Program just this week had to cut food rations to refugees in Jordan and Turkey. So if people aren't fed, they're going to move, right? So, you know, you're, there needs to be a greater funding of that. And the other thing is that the refugees we're seeing on, the, on, on that sort of road through Central Europe are serious future. They're the ones who are the middle and professional class who could afford the $10,000 to be smuggled. And with every teacher and architect and doctor that leaves Syria, it will make it that much more difficult for, to rebuild the country when peace, once peace arrives. And that's just one of the many facets of the, of the tragedy that we're seeing. Sorry, I'll go back to taking questions. So <laughs> go ahead. Uh, sorry, hi. Uh, thank you both for coming and having this great discussion. Uh, my name is Andrew Schneider, and I'm a col uh, college freshman. My question is, uh, how do you get, when you look at the numbers of aid, uh, especially in Afghanistan and Iraq, but also uh, from a lot of other countries uh, of the 33 that you mentioned, a lot of that is coming from either the US or other Western European countries, All of that, a lot of that money. A lot of the private philanthropy is also coming from individuals from those places. So how do you convince or bring in uh, private philanthropy or uh, institutional aid from governments from, that are not in those places, that is not in the sort of Western countries, either if, it, if it's in India or China, how do you bring those people in and convince them to either uh, give more loans or add to the institutions 
so that it's more of a global focus as opposed to you know, just the Western countries going in and trying to help uh, the, uh, those 33 countries, uh, fragile countries. Thank you. I, I'm glad you raised it. It's a really important issue because the, the aid architecture is changing. And I think and, and, and it's, it's one issue that I would have raised with more time because I think that one of the positive elements of thinking about how the a global governance architecture will change um, is um, a greater uh, engagement of different players um, with different capacities, um, different abilities to engage, um, different tolerances for risk, um, uh, and that would, to some extent, create a little bit more diversity in some of those areas that, that I sort of recommended as challenges. China is the most obvious example. Um, China has become an important investor, an, an important player in a very unique type of, develop, of assistance. Um, I, I wouldn't call it necessarily development aid, um, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of investing, building infrastructure, investing in infrastructure, transferring capacity, um, engaging um, uh, locally, um, and their willingness to do that, their willingness to sort of set up and engage, um, build an architecture and an infrastructure for management, for teaching management, um, for investing and building up worker capacity. Um, these are really important dimensions of the aid architecture that I think hold a lot of promise um, for thinking about how we might get this greater diversity, greater tolerance for risk, and, and new approaches and thinking about long-term institutional change, which I think they're actually more capable because they've been living through that long-term institutional change than some of the Western donors. So I think that's a very, very positive element. At the same time, it's also interesting to see that some of the very challenges that the UN faced, that the World Bank faced, on compliance issues, on corruption issues, on labor, on environmental sort of standards that built up a lot of the compliance architecture of the current development sort of model, the Chinese are beginning to face some of those pressures as well. Um, they're beginning to face some pressures from local communities um, that are sort of rejecting some tactics or approaches that they take um, to development interventions and to investment. Um, so we're starting to see them also sort of facing the pressures. But I still think this is tremendously positive because their reactions are different um, and the way in which they're going to handle these things ultimately um, might give us some real models for thinking about how we work in these most difficult environments. And the Chinese, of course, as you know, um, are, and the Turks, um, Indians, um, are really, um, really blazing trails in working in these most difficult environments and some of these most insecure environments and in environments of conflict. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. First, thank you both for coming again. Um, my question is for Dean Hellman. Uh, I'm, I'm from the Hoya. My name is Owen Egan. I'm a reporter. Um, you mentioned in your presentation uh, about the use of Georgetown student, alumni, and Jesuit resources to combat the issues of global governance. My question is, are there any specific policy directives that you currently have in mind to implement that action? On my sort of <laughs> sixth week on the job, <laughs> um, as I'm beginning to learn all of the, um, you know, all the tremendous resources that we have um, across Georgetown, um, I, I think um, uh, I'm only beginning to touch on the tremendous potential there is to rethink these issues. What I've already seen and what I can tell you is that you know, we do have here um, real centers of excellence that look at key components um, of the challenges that we're facing, whether it's from the regional studies an angle so that they understand the culture, the histories, and the difficulties in institutional um, sort of change that we see in different regions of the world, and we have some of the strongest capacity and understanding of regional issues um, of any sort of school um, of international affairs across the country. Um, we have sort of a strong program in security studies. We have a strong new program in global human development. Um, we have um, resources across the university. One thing that we can do in the university sort of setting that is so difficult to do in our settings, my previous setting in the World Bank in the UN, um, is bring some of those resources together um, to really think through different angles of a problem. 
Um, and I think so we have a tremendous capacity to do that. Not to mention the fact, as um, you alluded to, that we also have an alumni network of people who are sort of actively engaged in this from all sides, whether it's the private sector, whether it's the development sector, whether it's NGO, whether it's private philanthropy, and we can pull them in. So we're only beginning to think through what the agenda for change is going to be. We have a great opportunity with the centennial of the School of Foreign Service to think through our vision about uh, what are we thinking are the main challenges um, for um, all global um, uh, development and human affairs as we go forward. And I hope that this, given my exit experience, given our expertise here, can be an important part of that dialogue about where we're going. And I do think that because we do have a strong motivation for our own values, the Jesuit values that motivated the school, the founding of the school, which was in itself motivated um, by the desire to try to secure a stable foundation for peace and prosperity in the 20th century when it was first created in 1919, and that we have this organizational network around the globe linked to these Jesuit institutions creates sort of tremendous opportunities for us. And I think we're going to look for ways of really tapping them. Great. I'm told. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. I just want to say thank you. Unfortunately, I'm told we have to, we're, we're out of time, but I know uh, Dean Hellman's going to be here for years to come, so I'm sure there'll be lots of opportunities so. to <laughs> answer your, your questions. Uh, and I'll turn it back over to Tom. Just a final uh, word or two. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Stefan, for sharing your analysis and your vision. As you said in your last answer, these are issues that we'll be grappling with within SFS and across the university for years to come. Just a couple of announcements. The next two lectures in this series I wanted to briefly mention. Dr. Margaret Chan, Director General of the World Health Organization, will be here on September 30th to address global health challenges. And then on October 28th, we'll hear from uh, September 30th. And then October 28th, we'll hear from UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Antonio Gutierrez, who will uh, join us to consider migration and humanitarian issues. Again, two further challenges that are in the headlines, uh, critical challenges for us today and into the future. I invite you to join us for those events, for other events, to learn more about the Global Futures Initiative through the various publications on offer and for our website. In closing, I would like to thank all the staff who made the event today possible. It was really a team effort to thank you all for coming and to ask you to once again thank our speakers for spending time with us today.